support Lightning Debate on Patreon. Hi guys, it's Jeff here, and this is just going to be something quick because I know the season is rapidly approaching and this is around the time where the first tournaments are going around. So if you are a novice or you know a novice, I suggest you share them with this video right here right now because I'm going to be going over the five most common mistakes that novice debaters in PF, LD, or policy make when they go to their first tournament or they have their first debates. All right, so let's just get right into it. So let's go with number five. I think, well, the fifth worst thing you could do at a tournament is not calling cards. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, this is a problem for most debaters at most levels. In public forum, they're really good at calling their cards. In Lincoln Douglas, they're not that great at calling their cards. In policy, they already know the cards so they don't really need to call it. But if you are a novice level, it's totally different. So few novice teams actually take the time to call cards on evidence that they're unfamiliar with or happens not to be in a line with the evidence that they've read. And it's actually a big mistake because more often than not, if you are unfamiliar with cards and a card or infinites that your opponent presents you happens to be so outrageously overpowered, it happens to be fake. Either that or the card is either misled or it's been taken out of context or something is BS about the card. And don't let that be intimidating to you because the best way to take out that card is to call for it and look at the card yourself. Now, when you look at the card yourself, you need to analyze it yourself. You need to look at it and say, okay, is this card clipped? Meaning that they took a word here, a word there to make the card say that it's something that it doesn't say. If that is something that says, you can tell that to the judge right there and says, look, that's not what their card says. It's completely different and takes out all their offense there. You wanna look at dates. You wanna see, okay, how long ago was this card like presented? If it was 1980 or like 1990, I mean, that's pretty out of date. That's 15 to 20 years ago. You, If you have evidence that contradicts this and it happens to be f more recent, you want to make sure that you tell the judge, listen, don't listen to what they're saying because what we're saying is what's the most recent information that's out there. They're telling you evidence that comes from 20 years ago. There's been a lot of progression. You shouldn't even listen to that. Easy offense right there. If you see that your opponent is telling you something exaggerated, like the numbers don't align, and you see that their study that they've presented happens to be from a case study done with about 20 people, 30 people, even if it's as little as 100 people, if it's talking about like a large sample of people, it's something that affects a large amount of people. If they use a small sample size, like 100 people, 100 or less, you need to tell them, look, even though their numbers say that, their sample size is really, 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 really small compared to the people it affects. So that num those numbers aren't consistent and that actual study has not been replicated. So you shouldn't be looking worried about that. These are the ways you be are going to be able to win your very first rounds at your very first tournaments by knowing that you need to be cutting cards. But don't be too mad if you don't call cards because it's an actually a problem for a lot of debaters. So number four, the number four worst thing you can do is not using your prep time. So often, I when I judge it around, I tell the debaters, you remember, you have so much prep time. In like in Douglas, it's four minutes. In PF, it's two minutes. I'm not, I don't remember how much it is in policy, but you get some level of prep time to use before you speak, before you ask questions, after you ask questions, you have prep time to use however you want. And so often, that person ignores that I told them they can use their prep time, they have maybe three minutes left of their prep time, they don't use it, and then they stutter or stammer through their speech, you can tell they're not prepared, they don't really know what they wanna say, and it's just a waste because you had that prep time you could have used, you could have sat down, you could have calmed yourself, you could have written some things down of what you wanted to say, you could have gathered your thoughts. Even if you don't do anything, you just sit to use and chill. That's still better than rushing in and you're not prepared. You're either not emotionally prepared, you're not mentally prepared, you are not able to give a good speech if you don't use your prep time. And let me be honest with you, most novices their first time speaking, they are going to be very, very, very nervous. 
So it's best to use your prep time. Use all of it that you can and use it strategically so you can at least, even if you know what you're doing and you know what you're going to say and you can fill your time, at least calm yourself down and get the jitters out of you so you can get at least be more fluent and be more clear when you're going to speak. So I'm telling you right here, it's a good idea to use your prep time. Do not waste it. Do not leave it on the table. Even veterans, varsity debaters who've been dating at the longest time, they've been debating at the highest level, they still don't rush in even if they're overpowering their opponents. If they are overpowering their opponents, they still use the prep time because they know how valuable using that prep time is. So don't think that you're better than them and you can't, don't need to use the prep time. Use it. The next thing that you need to be worried about that I gets, gets me on my nerves too when I see it is not flowing. And by, by flowing, I mean don't, not taking notes. When you are not taking notes, when your opponents are speaking, you're losing. Unless that person is saying the most basic thing possible and you already know their case, you need to be taking notes on how you're going to deal with them, what arguments you're going to be using, how, what did they say in the first place, because more often than not, those kids who do not take notes on what their opponents say don't remember what their opponents say. They'll get into that rebuttal and completely misremember what their opponent's arguments were, and guess what? That rebuttal is wasted now because their opponents are going to re-explain what they said before, and they're going to win that argument now because you didn't understand or you didn't take the time to just write down what they said. And this is a key problem. Don't make that rookie mistake. Don't be that person who says, oh, I'll be fine. And don't bring at least a piece of paper to write on. At least get the contention taglines. You need to make sure that you flow. And even if you miss what they said, don't just ignore it. Ask them during cross-examination. That's what it's for. At least do that during cross-examination. Ask them, okay, what was your contention one? What was your contention two? Could you repeat your value criterion? Could you repeat your framework? At least ask and try to verify what was their arguments and try to write that down somewhere. So when you try to make those rebuttals, you are at least alluding to what they said and make sure that what you're there saying is accurate. And also, if you don't understand what your opponent's arguments are, cross-examinations that, that too. Ask them to explain. If you didn't hear, ask them what, what you say said. If you didn't understand, tell them to explain it in a simpler way. What are you arguing with? What is your saying? I don't understand what you're saying. Please make it clear to me what is the argument. That's what it's for. Even if you don't ask them any questions that really trap them, it's better to understand what they're saying and use some prep time in order to reaffirm yourself and think about, okay, how am I going to answer this? Than to not understand what they're saying, make a completely baseless rebuttal and have your opponent just wreck you in the next speech. So you need to make sure that when you're debating in rounds, you need to be flowing at least somewhere on something, making notes and making sure that you know what your opponent has been saying. Number two, the second worst thing you could do, and this is the most common thing, and it's honestly not a lot of people's fault. Eight people get nervous, but it's not finishing speech. A lot of times when I'm dredging rounds, a kid gets nervous and they're shy and they just they just don't finish their speech. They have two minutes left and then they say, ah, and they sit down. So I understand the reason why it gets really nerve wracking talking in front of people. However, this is one of the most detrimental things you could do in a round because often, more often than not, you are going to get points for finishing through the speech even if you don't say anything else more of substance than not finishing the speech. Because when you show that you finished the speech, at least you're going to get trooper points and you're going to make it more likely that your judge is going to vote for you because then they see that you are confident in your win. No one, psychologically, when you see someone give up halfway, you are less likely to believe that they are the correct one. So often, I've seen kids that were actually winning arguments, that actually could have won the argument, and then they just gave up in the middle of the speech and honestly lost the argument. Because I remember thinking in my head, okay, this kid only needs to say one thing. If he just says one thing, if she just says one thing, they're gonna win that round. This debate is already over, and the kid doesn't say anything. They don't say the one thing, and they just gave up halfway. And I'm thinking, man, you lost, not because 
you weren't going to win anyway. It's because you sat down. You didn't say the one thing you needed to say. And it wasn't even something that was super substantive. You just had to repeat something. I've had watch, I've watched my own debaters and just watching in the debates, they're shy. They don't really want to speak. They're, they're nervous. And I'm just thinking in my head, please, please, please. You just need to say one thing. I don't care if you don't say anything else but this one thing. Please say that one thing. You don't know what that thing is. You don't know what's going on in the mind of the judge. So at all times, at least fake it that you think you're going to win because that's more likely to help you get the win than just giving up. So don't give up. And even if you're not gonna win or it's not gonna help you win, at least give yourself the chance to practice because it's going to happen. You're going to be, you'll have to speak in front of people in our age, in our culture. So if you just give up, you're at least not giving yourself the chance to practice conquering your fear of public speaking. Public speaking happens to be one of the number one fears in America. If you want to challenge yourself and make sure you're improving upon yourself, at least give you the chance by finishing the speech and finishing strong and knowing that you can have the confidence that you tried your best to do what you can. And finally, the number one problem I see is not knowing the topic. Now, this one is more not really a problem for the novices, but they are the ones who suffer the most from it. So what ends up happening is every novice tournament, at least one kid comes into the tournament and does not have the right topic. They've gone confused by seeing that online it says, okay, there is a novice topic. And they prepare for that novice topic and then everyone else has prepared for the regular topic and no one has prepared the novice topic. And now everyone's saying, okay, the debate is on the regular topic. And that kid says, oh, I prepared the novice topic. So therefore I don't have a case. This is a rampant problem. And honestly, it's not really that kid's fault because more often than not, it, that kid says, oh, my coach told me to use this topic. Oh, my coach uh, said, this is the topic we were going to do. I don't know why we didn't have, know what the right what topic was. So if you're a novice, and you know, and you're not sure that your coach or whoever told you knows that the topic is, even if you're sure, go ask whoever is in charge of the court, of coordinating your tournaments, or who's ever in charge of knowing which tournaments you're going to, and please ask them to confirm what topic you're doing in your event, because it is the most important thing. Trust me, if you don't know the topic, you are going to lose no matter what, and you're not gonna get any benefit from debating because you don't even know what we're talking about. So you can't even get educational value if you don't know the right topic. So you're basically disqualified and you basically wasted your time and your money. So don't try and do that. Make sure that you go to your coach and say, is this the right topic? Did the people at the tournament verify you by email that this is the topic. Put pressure on them to make sure and verify that's the topic. Because so many times I feel so bad walking into a round about to judge it down and I'm telling them, okay, this is the topic. And they're like, oh, 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 uh, but, but I always thought it was this was the topic. It's so disheartening because you're like, man, this kid could have had a shot, but now he's deprived of all chance to compete because he just didn't know the right topic. And it's probably not even his fault because it's coach gave him the wrong information. So I'm telling you right here, right now, make sure you know the right topic. All right, guys, that's gonna be it for the video. Like and subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms and support us on Patreon. You have a wonderful day and Jeff out. See ya.